So <clears throat> the Jamboard um, has already some prepar prepared material on it, but I will sort of talk you through it. So there is also, as I mentioned earlier, a link. I think it's now on also in the chat. So the, the, uh, in the middle here uh, of the slide, there is this table of some notation, some syntax for logic. And this is copied directly out of the book. So this is from one of the first pages of chapter two. So this is just a reminder that you're expected to read chapter two this week and do exercises on those parts. Um, so some common notation uh, for false is bottom or just F. And for true, it's top or T. And negation is often used something which is sometimes called third. And then and is a cap and or is a cup. Implies sometimes using a uh, rounded arrow and sometimes a more pointed arrow. And I think you've all seen these different notations in different cases. There are other versions as well. Um, I have uh, included four examples, P1 to P4 over here on the left, which are examples of logic expressions used over two variables, A and B. And uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, truth tables. So one way of evaluating these expressions, because as they have variables in them, they will have a different Boolean uh, truth value, uh, depending on the assignment of uh, truth values to the, to the variables. So let's do one of those examples. This is things you already know from elsewhere, uh, the table over here on the right, the table for implication, and the little one and two here, and the arrows is to indicate that you first fill in the one column, and then you fill in the two column, and you go, go on from there. So if, if we start with true, true, false, false, we can't see. Hmm. What is it you can't see? Um, you can press the camera box and select to just show him. I'm not sure what is it. So I'm, I'm trying to share my screen here and it says I'm screen sharing. And the screen sharing right now is sharing just one Chrome window, which is the Jamboard. So hopefully you can in that Jamboard see that I have now half filled in a table on the right. Uh, of the implication of A arrow B. Okay, so it seems that um, several people can see it. So I hope that um, um, it works for everyone. Okay, okay, uh, hope this is sorted now. So I have filled in uh, two different possible values, uh, true and false for the A variable, and then um, the same we can do for the B variable. So now I do true, false, true, false. Um, and uh, now we got all the different variants. There are four different rows in the table because there are four different truth assignments to two variables. Had it been five variables, it would be two to the power of five rows. And of course, nobody in the right mind would be filling in that many rows, but uh, then you do it with other methods. But just for illustration, it's useful. So I filled in column one, uh, or the, the first and the third column, and now I will fill in the, the middle. So the middle column is supposed to be the value of applying the operator implies. So this is like an infix operator, like multiply or addition or something like that, but it works on Booleans instead. So this is a bit like filling in the multiplication table uh, where you say that five times five is 25 and different things like that. So this is filling in the, all the possibility of the implication table. So let's see what we've got. Uh, true implies true. Yes, that's is true. Uh, true implies false. So the second row is most definitely not the case. So if true is 
is true, then we should not get a false. So that's a false. And then it's the question, what happens in the two cases where we got a false on the left-hand side? What should be the value of the implication if the left-hand side of the implication is false? Yes, true. So why is it true? Well, the implication is supposed to show uh, the truth value of the whole expression, if A, then B. So if the first thing is false, then everything follows. So if you start with something false, then you can prove whatever you want. So we have in this uh, multiplication table, the result under the arrow in the middle. Uh, we will soon do the, this one uh, on, the, on the left as well. But uh, this is the difficult part with truth tables that you can't really see the dynamics in the end result. But I'm trying to show that with the green numbers underneath here. So first fill in one variable, fill in the next variable, and then start filling in in the columns in the middle um, the results of evaluating that operator. OK, so here we've done on the left, I've done a similar thing. And as you can see here, it's just the end result. And this is illustrating P4. So the, the claim is that if A and B holds, then B and A should hold. And to evaluate that, we first fill in the A. That's false, false, true, true. And in actually one more place, false, true. Now, this is strange. False. These two are swapped. I've been too quick in filling this in. Let's, let's erase some stuff. I mean, A can, must definitely be equal to A. Let's, let's erase those two. Uh, so it said on the left, false, false, true, true. So this must also be false, false, true, true. And then the B column, this column here, should be the same as this column here. So that's false, true, false, true. And then this question, um, what is the value of and? of B and A. So, well, if, it, if any of the two are false, then we get false. So false, false, false. And the only case we get true is the last case down here. And similarly, on the left. So the third and fourth steps here are after we filled in the variables, we can compute the AND. And I've illustrated in the middle here, the syntax tree of this P4. So at the top level, there is an implication. And then there is an AND of A and B. And each column represents the truth values of the sub-expression rooted at that symbol. So this column, for example, corresponds to the subtree A and B. Now I use the AND here and the the other notation for and here, but they are both the and. So each column represents the truth values directly underneath a part of the syntax. So this and is the and on the left, and this and is the and on the right. OK, and then finally, we should fill in the results of the implication. And to fill in that one, we only need to look at the column with the number three down here and the column with the number four down here, because the implication just takes the result from this whole subtree and the result of this whole subtree and combines them according to the rules in the table we already filled in. So there is only only there is actually four rows, but there are only two variants. So there is the false implies false which we can look up somewhere there. False implies false, gives us true. So that will be true, true, true. And then we got the case where true and true 
should be combined with implication. And that gives us the fourth true. So this is how to fill in the truth table. That is not something we teach in this course. It's just an, uh, a repetition because we will also go to actually writing the evaluator in as Haskell code later. Um, so now as the column that we got to, the column underneath the top level symbol, which is the top level of this syntax tree, as that is always true, that means that this is a tautology. So P4 is an example of a tautology. 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 So P4 is an example of a tautology. And a tautology is, as it's always true, it means that actually, not syntactically, but semantically, this whole thing can be simplified to true. And that kind of simplifications is what is very useful if you have very big logic expressions. So that it might be that some sub expressions can be simplified to true and then that can cause further simplifications uh, when you go up the tree. So as you might imagine, if you have like a thousand Boolean variables, you will not evaluate two to the power of 1000 different cases, but it may still be possible to do algebraic simplifications to get it down to something manageable. And that is really, it's really done. I mean, it's, it's not just a, um, a, a theoretical possibility. People are really implementing simplifiers for extremely large Boolean logic expressions. So um, if we now compare um, P1 and try to see what could that be simplified to something? And now I didn't actually intend to circle it with the pen, but just circle it like this. So A and not A. Yeah, false is a suggestion in the chat here, and that's true. <laughs> well, it, it's correct that it is false. So we can um, check the two possible cases. One is true and false, and the other is false and true. And in both cases, we end up evaluating to false. So this can be simplified to false. So that is not a tautology. It's sort of an anti-tautology. It's something which is always false instead of always true. OK, what about P2? Yes, very rapid answer here in the chat. In the chat. So that is actually. So either the left or the right hand side will be true. So this can be simplified to true. So actually we have another example. P2 is also an example of a tautology. Okay, so P2 and uh, P4 are tautologies. P1 is always false and P3, it really depends on the values of A and B. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all on this first slide. I will now move on to the next uh, Jamboard page. And um, here I've, I've taken what was on the previous slide on the left and made it a little bit smaller. Um, and then I introduced a data type called prop for this propositional calculus. And uh, this propositional calculus, you could think about it very much like the evaluation expression data type we had from last week. So it has a number of operators and or implies. And each of those uh, operators, you see that there's a bit of a delay between the Jamboard and my screen, but anyway, yeah. And each of these operators take two props as arguments. So they are binary operators, just like addition, multiplication, or division and minus and so on. And then we have one unary operator, not. A unary means it takes us to one argument. Binary means it takes two arguments. Binary is a bit unfortunate because it's also overloaded to mean something completely different. And then we've got a base case. One of the leaves is a constant bool. So if you combine and you go all the way down to just true, false. And then the final constructor 
is the name construct or the variable case. I will call it name here because we will later extend this to first order logic where you also have another kind of variables at the same time. To avoid confusion, I would call these names and the others variables, but they function the same. They are placeholders for something we want to fill in later. And here I've decided just to encode names as strings. And the blue underline here is helping distinguish between name as a constructor, which is a function creating a value of the data type prop, and name as a type, which is here just defined to be string. So it might be a bit confusing, but Haskell distinguishes uh, the namespaces of uh, um, what is types and what is values. Okay, so using this syntax data type, we can give definitions in Haskell of P1 to P4. And this is also just copied from the book. So P1 to P4, they are all of type prop. They are syntax trees. Uh, here is an and of, and you can see here, now I can't say just and A as up here. I have to define A as name and then a string A, and then not name A and so on. And implies is the implication operator. And here is a little bit bigger expression. Implies and a b and b a. And you can see here to avoid writing too much text, I've introduced Haskell definitions of little a as name of the string a and little b as name of the string b. So otherwise, I would have to write name four times here. And now I only have to write it twice. OK, so we will not implement the full function here. We will do it in uh, Emacs later. But we should start thinking about the semantics here. So we want to translate the syntax. And that, in this case, is the prop data type. So we say prop here is the syntax. And then we want to tr translate it to some semantic type. And um, well, we want to get out from, from a proposition. Yeah, so, so bool is a suggestion here. So that's like, oops, I have to get a pen. That's like bool. So bool is a um, intended final value, but we can't quite get there uh, directly because we need something more. Because notice we've got the name case here. So we got uh, a parameterization, yes, values for variables. We, we need to have some kind of um, table that keeps track of the different values for the names. So we need to know what to do with n here. So, so let's just first say that we need a table. I'll just call it tab. So that would mean that the semantic type would at least have this shape. It's a function from a table to a Boolean. So the table itself should translate from names, actually strings, to Booleans. So what it's saying is, if we can translate the names, then we can translate the whole proposition. So the names are sort of the leaves in the tree. And if we just know what the names are translated to, then we can translate everything. OK, but then. What, would, what should we do with the table and what is it? How can we implement a table? So we can ask ourselves if we want to write the declaration here, type tab equal, what should we write? Well, there are different choices, but any, any suggestion? Okay, there is a suggestion here, string to bool. I will write it as name to bool. Um, yeah, so that's the equivalent. So if we have such a function, a function which will take any name and give us a Boolean value, then we could translate the whole thing to a Boolean. OK, so now there is a comment saying that this is not still completely true, that given a table, we can give a bool. But if the table doesn't contain the variable we need, Yes, yeah, so that's, that's uh, indicating that the table here 
uh, is usually when you when you say table, you usually think about something finite, which can only then give a Boolean value for a finite number of names, which would pos potentially be a problem. But here, what we have defined it to be is not something finite. This is actually a mathematical function from strings to Booleans. So this will have to give us a bool for each name. You could say that one way of easily implementing a table is to give a default case, which always returns false or true or something. Uh, but if you would have an alternative definition, so if you would have had a table prime, which then a list of pairs of names and booleans, that's also an option. Uh, if you would have this type, then you would get a trouble into trouble because when you look up a name, you might not find it. So in that case, the resulting type, if it would use tab prime here, then we couldn't just be sure to return a Boolean in the end. So an alternative full type, which I would write below here, if we used tab prime, then we would have to return a maybe bool. So this would be an alternative type prop to tab prime to maybe bool. So that's showing uh, so a bit of a trade off here about how to encode things. Um, and there are different other variants as well. But let's stick to the tab to bool function version now because it's convenient and it makes the possible to fill in the right hand side here of the case of the eval function on names. So what should be a value which will evaluate a name in this context? Tab n, mm. something like that. So tab with a capital T here is a type. Uh, and so we probably need to define a value of that type. So for example, we could say, we can take in a table t here, and then we could do as suggested, t applied to n. So notice that t is of type tab, meaning that it's a table, or actually in this case, a function from name to b to bool. So that's quite possible, um, t of n. And then just get a little bit feel for, for the rest of the structure, uh, what would be the implementation of not p. So notice here that p is a prop. p uh, is not a Boolean. Anyone have a suggestion? Eval P T. Not quite. Have you defined T to be a table? Well, uh, I have defined the type of eval to be this one, which means that the first argument, name N, is a prop, and the second argument, T, is a table. Well, where, where I say a table is, a function from name to be. Okay, here we got the suggestion for the evaluation. So this should be not, oops, I should have a real pen, not, uh, so the Boolean function not, this was now very messy. Let's try to make a real O in between there. Not of eval of P with this table. So notice I'm calling eval recursively with a sub expression P, which is a proposition. I will get a function from tab to bool. I will supply the same table T as I had from the beginning. And I will get a Boolean out. This expression is a Boolean. And then I will negate that Boolean. If it's true, it will be false. If it's false, it will be true. 
So that's the, the sort of style of this implementation. We'll see if we get back to the, to the live coding later, we can dig into the details. What would be an idiomatic name for this lookup table? Something like an environment or context? Yes, I. Um, it's, it's usually called an assignment function. Now somebody's typing, interesting. Assignment function. So that's usually the name of, of these tables. Uh, so values of the type tab are usually called assignment functions. So given an assignment function, something that assigns meaning to all the variables in the tree, we will assign a meaning to the proposition as a whole. I think somebody should mute themselves. I'm not sure where this is. OK. Next page. So now let's move to proofs. Um, so I will actually mix up here uh, a bit the typing and proving because, uh, well, partly it's a very convenient notation and partly it actually works. In uh, more advanced programming languages than Haskell, we can actually uh, do quite a bit of uh, implementation of proofs directly. So I hope you now see a Jamboard screen where I am have proofs as the heading and the explanation of the first little judgment, A colon capital A. So small a colon capital A is saying that the small a is a proof of the capital A. So the little colon is encoding is a proof of here. So then we can see a rule which is usually called and introduction. So logical rules are very often given in this form that you have a line and below the line are the conclusions and above the line are the assumptions. So the first reading of this, you can ignore the small parts and the colons and just say, and introduction says A and B implies A and B which is a bit like, well, very vacuous. But here it says something a little more. It says, if we have a proof little a of capital A and a proof B of capital B, then the pair of proofs A and B is a proof of capital A and capital B. And I have the little red text here saying that the, reminding you that this symbol is called and, and often written with an ampersand. So I'm claiming here that a proof of an and is actually a pair. And we will see later that we can actually implement it that way, which is very convenient. Um, another thing, another data type, which then has the corresponding role for or, is the either type. So this data type up in the corner is a data type which either has the form left x or right y for some x and y's. And in this case, we will use it to define the two rules or introduction and well, or introduction left and or introduction right. So these two rules. And the left rule is saying, if we have a proof of A, then left A will be a proof of A or B. So a way of proving that A or B is true is saying, well, actually A is true. So we do that by embedding the A in left. Left is telling us that this part is the true part. And again, here I got the red notation saying that this is pronounced or, uh, this is not a one, this is the bar, which is sometimes used in logic uh, expressions as uh, or. And the other introduction here, the or introduction right says if B is a proof of B, then right B is a proof of A or B. So there are two different ways of proving an or statement, these two ways.
Okay, now I move one slide for, forward. Uh, so I keep everything we had, but I've, on the left-hand side, I've added two more rules. So I had this first rule saying that if you want to prove an AND statement, you need a pair of proofs. The other one is saying that actually, if this is our way of coding up a proof, then we can say P is a proof of this AND, and that's a pair. Then we can take out the first component of P, and that will be a proof of A. Similarly, if P is a proof of A and B, the second component of P will be a proof of B. So these two rules down here, they are called AND eliminations, AND elimination left, AND elimination right. You can look up in the book the details there. But it's, it's just showing that the fact that we're using pairs to represent the proofs means that we can also use first and second, which are standard Haskell deficient definitions to extract the two components. Okay, and uh, now we get to doing something similar on the OR side. And here it was very, it was easy to build one, it was easy to take it apart. Uh, in the OR case, it's a little bit more difficult. So this is the rule, which is usually called OR elimination. So the one on the right here. So it has three assumptions. One is that A or B is true. And here we say, okay, let's, let's call that proof little e. And then it says, well, A must imply C and B must also imply that same C. So if that's the case, if we can prove C in two different ways, both through A and through B, and we know that one of them is true, then we can conclude that C is actually really is true. We don't have to sort of remember the A or B and this function and so on. We can just say, okay, we get a proof of C by combining these three components, the expression, the F and the G. And you may wonder why I called these proofs F and G. Uh, I mean, usually F and G are, are used to denote functions. And it's not obvious why you would call these functions. But just as I have implemented AND with pairs and OR with the either type, I can implement implication with function types. So this might take a while getting used to if you haven't seen it before, but the, the intuition is that if I'm using this whole framework here, which is a framework of, of um, proof terms, so I got really objects, real uh, terms to represent proofs, then what this function is telling me is, if you give me a proof term of the type A, meaning that A is actually true, then I will provide, the function f will provide a proof term to prove b. And that is what implication means. It's, it means if you assume a, you can prove b. So this is really a natural interpretation of what implication means when you use this, what is called proof terms. And as an example here of an actual use of this, let's implement or elimination. So or elimination here, I've written it as a little bit of a functional program. It has three arguments. And if we want to define it, we know that E is supposed to have either the form left or right. So we can write a case distinction here. This is trying to implement the function or elim, giving a proof of the left side of the A and B, which is called A or a proof of the right side, which is then a proof of B, which is called small lowercase b. And then we got these two functions f and g around. So any suggestions what we can write in this point on the right hand side of the first case?
we need here to produce a value of type C. Yeah, F of A is a suggestion here. So F, remember, is a function from A to C. And we have an A in scope, which is a type A, which means it's a proof of A. And if we apply F to A, we will get a value of type C, which is indeed in this interpretation is a proof of C. Okay, similarly, what should be the type or what should be the expression to be filled in in the second case? Yep, G of B. So the second function used on the other proof. So this, this is a rather concrete interpretation of what it means to do in or elimination. It just means look at the value. Is it a left or a right? Well, in one case use F, in the other case use G. To transform the proof of the left-hand side to a proof of C, or to perform the proof on the right-hand side to also a proof of C. Okay, this is nice. I had a little star here that I should break the recording at this point uh, to because I switched another topic. And I think that's very convenient because we're now at break time. Um, I just uh, like to mention that after the break, I will uh, have an interlude which I will talk specifically about assignment one, the sort of theory needed for assignment one. So I assume most of you will be very interested in that. Okay. A break until quarter past. Does it say or elim? Yes, it's a bit difficult to read here, but in the book it's more readable. Uh, and capital A, B, and C, are they of type prop? Well, if you encode them in Haskell, they are type prop, uh, but you can encode them in different systems in different ways. So here, this slide is basically about logic, so they are not of type prop in this specific case but we can get back to the details uh, after the break. <laughs> 